We've just sung that faith can accomplish astonishing things. And we have encouraged one another by saying that we will stand as children of the promise. Now, of course, the promise of God, the work of God, everything that God does first is the foundation of faith. So you must always remember that. So God has made promises. He has shown us most clearly that he has fulfilled and will fulfill all his promises by sending his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who uh, fulfills the Lord's purposes. Uh, and so we can trust in him. And by faith we can live our day at lives, day by day. By faith perhaps we can even do some unexpected things, some wonderful things. There's a great chapter in the book of Hebrews, which is a list of the heroes of faith from the Old Testament. And actually it's a quite a bit of a motley crew, if we're honest. There's all sorts of people who uh, uh, may know the stories about Abraham and Moses in particular, but there's others in there. You know, Samson, he was a bit of a mixed up old chap, wasn't he? You know, did a great things, but also fell really badly. Just think of David, Solomon, all sorts of people from the Old Testament. These were people of faith. That chapter in Hebrews, which is another potential one I might have read as well, uh, and I'm only going to mention it to you, so if you're familiar with it, this makes sense to you. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's just a, a, a summary of some great characters from the Old Testament. And we're told some of them uh, accomplished amazing things, and others, by faith, simply endured really horrible things, actually. So it's not like faith is some button you can press to make life go perfectly well for you. That would be completely wrong. But faith is important. But I wonder how your faith is this morning. <coughs> I wonder how you would describe it. I wonder if your faith is sure and secure. I wonder if you have assurance in your heart about the love of God and about what Jesus Christ has done and about who you are in him. Some of the answers to that will be different between you. Some people will have no assurance of faith at all. Some of you, uh, I don't know any of you really, I've met one or two of you a little bit, but I really don't know any of you. That kind of gives me a disadvantage, but it also gives me an advantage, because I can assume that at least uh, someone here might have no faith, no pretense of faith. I uh, can't even imagine that there could be something that, uh, that, that, that is, is, is a sure promise. So perhaps you have no faith, no assurance. Some people here might have a wrong faith and a wrong assurance. It goes along the line of, yes, God forgives me, that's his job. It's getting less and less in our culture, but I'm sure you still know people who will call themselves Christian fill that little box in when it comes to uh, any time they're, they're asked. And they go to funerals and they hear people promising that, you know, ensure and certain hope of the resurrection because that's what the service says and they have this vague idea uh, that, well, yeah, God's there, certainly, great, he, he, he's going to forgive us, it's all going to be okay. It's, uh, presumptuous faith. Strangely, it can be both be vague and certain. Vague because they don't really know what you know what's really going on with God, but also presumptuous that whoever or whatever he is, uh, hopefully it means that everything will work out okay. <clears throat> so 
It's also possible um, that your faith is variable. In fact, it's probable that your faith is variable. If you today are a Christian, you've been part of this church for some time, or perhaps part of another church, you have a testimony, you have a story of how the Lord saved you, perhaps you can, uh, perhaps that's days ago or decades ago, uh, and you, you, know, you say, I'm a Christian, I've been baptised, I'm, I'm walking with the Lord, uh, and have done for however long, I suspect the truth is for you, faith and assurance is variable. There have been times when you've been absolutely sure and assured. And there are other times where, for all sorts of reasons, you've been less I know this because the Bible tells me about all those heroes of the faith, Old Testament and New Testament, who had this variable, vague <laughs> problems with faith. I mentioned Peter right at the beginning. You know, there he was, this great leader of the church, but he had his doubts. His doubts even to the extent that he would he would deny Jesus. I also know it from experience. I know from my own experience as a Christian, I've been a Christian now for 40-ish years, um, and I know that my experience of assurance and faith has gone <clears throat> up and down. There have been times where I've just wondered, where are you, Lord? And there are other times where I've just had an absolute sense of certainty. And praise God, over the time, that sense of certainty has grown deeper and firmer. But I don't want to be presumptuous and think, oh, oh, everything's fine now. Nothing will ever shake me. Then you have to go back and read the Psalms. Psalms are full of people like King David wondering what God is doing. So if you can honestly say to me that you have absolutely clear faith that never doubts or even has a slightest hint of doubt uh, that you have perfect assurance. Well, first of all, I'd love to know your secret, you could tell me afterwards. Second of all, I'm a bit doubtful, but you know, okay, I'm not gonna call anyone a liar. But third, watch out for tomorrow. <coughs> Because if your faith has not been shown yet, I can say that it will be. But you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes going through the process of doubt forces us to really rethink, you know, well, what is my faith all about? The Lord gives us times of growth and times of peace. Uh, at, at, at times of blessing. But it also leads us through times of trial, times of difficulty, times when our faith is, is shaken. And sometimes he shakes that faith because there's some stuff he wants to get rid of in your life. But sometimes he shakes that faith because he wants you to be even more sure and make sure that you're sure about the right things. So, again, back to Peter in our first reading, uh, he writes to those people saying, listen, you've, you already know your faith, but I'm writing these things because it's good for you. It's good to be reminded. We always need reminding, don't we? You have the, the Lord's Supper next week. Uh, what's one of the things that's absolutely central to the Lord's Supper is do this in remembrance of me. It's a, it's a reminder now, it's more than a reminder. It's not like some sort of 
biblical knot in the hanky, which says, oh yes, Jesus died on the cross. It's more than that. <laughs> We're called to reflect upon it deeply and be amazed and wonder and uh, be reminded that we are sinners in need of a saviour, but also be reminded that actually the Bible calls us saints who struggle with sin and that as we grow together in grace, as we grow together in faith, we uh, are being sanctified, we are being developed, we are being changed by God. And because we need reminding, I want to take us to a passage this morning, and then again this evening, to talk about some people who needed reminding, whose faith maybe was being challenged or just needed to be grown in their faith. This evening we're going to talk about a chap called Zechariah, uh, but this morning we're going to talk about a chap called Theophilus. <coughs> Theophilus is there in verse 3 of Luke chapter 1. Uh, Theophilus is the person to whom Luke is writing. And his name means friend of God, or person who loves God. Some people have speculated that Luke is kind of using a, a sort of general name to, uh, as the introduction to his, his book. I wouldn't fall out with anybody who thought that. Uh, but I think the way it's written tends to suggest that this is, this is a real person who, by God's grace and kindness and providence, also has a name which reminds us that it can be written to all of us. Someone who's a friend of God. So this is written to Christians. But I think that the Gospels are written, you know, the Gospels for non-Christians. Actually, the Gospels for, you know, the Gospels, the four Gospels are written for Christians. To build us up in our Faith. <clears throat> this is someone, we are told, who has been taught the faith. There it is in verse 4. Uh, there are things that you have been taught. Uh, I wonder who taught you the gospel for the first time? I wonder if it was Sunday school. Anyone, anyone, anyone would say brought up in Sunday school? I wasn't, so um, yeah, great. Great privilege. Uh, perhaps it was parents who first told you uh, the stories of Jesus. I use the word story carefully. Histories, real life stories, but stories nevertheless. Who was it who first told you the gospel? Who was it uh, who explained to you what Jesus said and did and why he did it and what he accomplished. Probably more than one answer to that question. Uh, perhaps it was a parent, a Sunday school teacher, a friend, a neighbour. Uh, perhaps there's been a, a few pastors in your church over, the t over, over your Christian life who've helped you, who've taught you, who have encouraged you. And Theophilus, well, he's been taught the Christian Faith. This is a Christian, someone who knows something about God. Probably describes, again, I'm guessing, but I'm taking an educated guess that that describes uh, the majority of people in this room. But Luke says to Theophilus, I want to write this for you so that you may know the certainty of things you have been taught. So that you may be encouraged even more. As I was preparing this, I was uh, thinking about some of the people I've known in the past. In uh, as a pastor, and I just want to describe to you three people who I think 
Uh, these are real people, they're just summaries, I'm not using their real name, very, very unlikely you would ever <laughs> know them, because <laughs> they're, they're a long way away. Um, I wonder if any of them are like you, or you were like them. First of all, there's Pete, who always wants more information. So he'll be listening to Theophilus and thinking, to, to Luke and thinking, oh, thanks very much, I always want some more. The funny thing with Pete is that he's had lots of his answers, his questions answered already. He just holds back. So, one sense when um, Luke is writing to Theophilus, when he's hoping that someone like Pete will hear, he's uh, not um, saying that, you know, I'm just going to repeat things endlessly over and over and over again, although we do need repetition. Repetition is good. Anyone who's a teacher knows that uh, repetition is good. But Luke's going to challenge him with the fact that, you know what? There comes a point where you must believe. There are people in the stories of Jesus who encounter him just once and put their trust in him. The problem with Pete is that I don't think he really wants to believe. I think he uses the questions which he asks as an excuse. He doesn't really want to have them all answered because that would have too much impact upon his life. He's happy to kind of be vaguely attached to church, uh, to come along, to be a bit religious. Um, Luke will say, well, hang on, the things I'm writing to you, well, I do want you to be more certain, but I want you to be certain, A, that you can believe, and B, that you must believe. There comes a point where you have to just stop asking questions and say, Jesus has done enough. There comes a point where you have to look at the cross and the resurrection and you might say, well, I don't understand everything that went on in the cross and resurrection and that's a lifetime study in and of itself. But on the other hand, it's simple enough that a child can understand it. I've done wrong. I deserve punishment. Jesus took that punishment. Now he's alive. In him I can be alive. It's kind of as simple as that and as rich and as deep as that. <clears throat> Someone else I can think of needed certainty in a different way. Uh, she, I think she probably is a Christian. I'm a bit less convinced about Pete. I don't think Pete is or was. Jennifer struggled with the thought that she could be forgiven. She kind of knew she had been but she kind of couldn't quite believe it. She had a, what should we call it, a troubled background, difficult background, uh, horrible background actually, some of the ways that she was treated, both by parents and by husband, has to be said. You can think of psychological reasons and emotional reasons and sociological reasons why she might not really be able to believe that she's forgiven. But whatever the cause is, she, she couldn't really, she struggled to believe that she could be forgiven. Wouldn't you, definitely wouldn't say she's the most obvious and horrible and awful sinner I've ever met. You know, I'm not talking about someone I met in prison who's a murderer or something. You know, it's just someone who couldn't believe the things that she had done. So Luke will write stories of forgiveness, will write stories of redemption, will write stories of hope, will tell um, <laughs> Jennifer uh, that uh, whether it's a centurion uh, or whether it's a, a, a sinful woman, as the <laughs> headings uh, put it in chapter 7, yes, even you. Now, to an extent to which everyone who's a Christian should have that sort of doubt. Can, can I be forgiven? Me? There's a sort of appropriate way in which you can think, 
hang on a minute, this is unbelievable. But Luke will write, yes, even you. And all the stories of all the four Gospels, all the different people that Jesus meets uh, in all sorts of different contexts. Yes, even you, you're a teacher of Israel and Nicodemus. Even you, Mary Magdalene. Even you, Peter, and I know what <laughs> up and down your face is going to be. Even you. And Luke says to Jennifer, listen, you can be forgiven. In Christ, all the way at the end of my book, <laughs> you will, I will show you that he's died on a cross. And I will show you that repentance and forgiveness of sins is going to be preached across the whole world. And then actually in my second book, I'm going to prove that that happened. Even you. thought of a chap called David. Again, false names, but real person. Been really, really let down by people. Christian people. People who, as far as I know, are genuinely Christians. <coughs> very, very hurt by people who've been Christians for a while should have known better. Perhaps a slightly extreme example in, in many ways. But a reminder that if you become part of a church, you are gathered together with sinners who are saved, saints who struggle with sin, Two sides of the same coin, you can think about both. The New Testament kind of presents Christians in, in both those categories. And therefore, things go wrong. Most of Paul's epistles were written to situations where stuff had gone wrong. I don't know if that's you, maybe just in little ways. And it makes you kind of cross with the people, but actually it makes you question, well, is Christianity really true? If they're Christians, do I want to be with them? Shall I pop off and go to a different church? That's one solution. The other solution, Luke will say, is actually Jesus doesn't let you down. Because he definitely did die upon a cross. He definitely did raise, he was definitely raised from the dead. So Luke wants to write an orderly account of things that actually happened, focusing on the things that Jesus said and did, and like the other gospel writers, <coughs> introducing lots of different individuals and you know the occasional crowd or group of twelve or you know real people, so that certainty is not just about. Here are a set of things I can prove, even though there are, you know, there's stuff that you can prove, there's things that are, are clear and certain. But so that every way in which we might doubt is countered in a clear and orderly way. He captures every thought of every different type of person. Perhaps you're an analytical sort of person. Well, Luke sets things out in an orderly way so you can follow his story through. I would encourage you, actually, if you've not done it recently, to read Luke or one of the other Gospels through from start to finish. You might need a you know, couple of sittings, but you know, do it in half an hour slots at least. Because you then you really see how Luke 
paints a picture and he makes it clear and it's all orderly and everything moves towards the conclusion of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So if you're an analytical person, read the gospel, see it. <clears throat> Perhaps you're more emotional, a people person, that's great. Read about the people. See how Jesus dealt with people. See how Jesus can deal with you or the person sitting next to you or that person who actually you have found a bit difficult within the church. <clears throat> Luke writes to Theophilus and Luke writes to us so that we can be more certain. Just think a little bit about what he actually tells us. He tells us this is a careful account. So it's not a sort of careless collection of random thoughts thrown together. He tells us that uh, what happened was a fulfillment. These things are promised. These things that happened in Jesus, they're, they're the culmination of a story, hundreds, thousands of years old. That in itself is an encouragement, isn't it? <laughs> the fact that Jesus fulfills things that we were told were going to happen um, it is amazing. And then actually when you look at Jesus and then you look back at the Old Testament, it's, it's kind of a two-way street. You can see, ah, oh, that's what it was always talking about. Jesus. He tells us that this is about uh, things that were witnessed by people. Peter mentioned that in the earlier reading. I was an eyewitness, he said. Actually, he focuses that I was the eyewitness of the glory of Jesus. But he was an eyewitness of everything else that Jesus said and did. And Luke says, well, you know, I'm going to bring together a careful account of this, a clear account, so that you can know what you need to know. Uh, we know from the Apostle John, he mentions that if everything Jesus did was written down, there wouldn't be enough books. So Luke, like John, is selective, but he's not sort of getting rid of the inconvenient bits. He tells us the whole story of the things that we need to know. And he helps Theophilus with the things he's already learned, with the things that he has already been taught by good ministers, by good <laughs> ministers of the word already, so that he can be more <coughs> certain. There is enough for any of us to believe and trust. There are stories of forgiveness and the story of forgiveness. There is Jesus who does not let us down, even though human beings will. And so this morning I just want to encourage you. with the basic thing that you know, don't be afraid of your own uncertainties okay um, if you think everyone else is completely certain and you're the only one who has ever sort of wobbled in your faith well no not true uncertainty is not uncommon uncertainty is not necessarily bad. It, it can be bad. Uh, uncertainty can be paralyzing. Uh, if you're uncertain about everything, then it makes it very difficult to make decisions. It's very difficult to, to live your life. You need, you need some sense of certainty. But if in those moments of doubt, you are forced to come back 
and say to Luke, okay, here I am, I'm feeling a bit uncertain, remind me about Jesus, and it forces you to read Luke. Or it forces you to come back and remember someone like Peter, with all his weaknesses, his strange ways, and the, uh, the ways in which he failed. And it reminds you, you know, makes you think about him, and uh, he reminds you that you've got the same faith that he had. It's an amazing truth, isn't it? Well, that's a good thing. It forces you to come back to Jesus. It forces you to come and just simply say, Lord Jesus, help! Help my lack of faith. And that's a good thing. Because Jesus is good and gracious and kind and patient and he deals with you and he deals with me and he's constantly building our faith so that we might live in a way that pleases him. So don't be afraid of uncertainty. Don't think uncertainty is always bad, although if you find it getting out of hand, then you're in a church, talk to the pastor or a good Christian friend. And always remember that when you do have uncertainty, there is always someone to talk to. That can be your pastor, that can be your friends, uh, that, that can be <laughs> perhaps Christians who aren't even in this church. Perhaps, you know, we've all got networks of people we know and love, don't we? But remember that this, the solution to us uncertainty is Jesus. Our faith might be wobbly. His work is firm. Our faithfulness might not be very faithful. His faithfulness in accomplishing the work that he was sent to do is absolutely perfect from beginning to end. And that's why I can say to anyone, even if you feel your faith is, is, is awful, an awful faith, a weak faith, a wavering faith, an up and down faith in the perfect Son of God is faith enough to say, I am forgiven. I am saved. I am on my way to an eternity with him. I need not fear the everyday trials of life, even though we do. I need not fear death, even though often people do fear it more than Christians are often willing to admit. Because Jesus is who he is. We can know certainty in him. Friend of God, like Theophilus, Luke writes to you and writes to me that we might know Jesus better. Let's pause for a few moments and pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would apply your words to our hearts and minds. Place it firmly in our memory. Make, may it change our understanding. And Father, may your word also work on our, our inner being, our inclinations, our, just the way we think, the way we are, our hearts. 
We pray for one another. Pray perhaps if anyone is going through a time of uncertainty, however cause, Lord, that you would be their comfort. And we pray, Father, that you would grant us that level of certainty that we can live day by day. And will you grant us uh, that assurance of faith that we can also hold it out to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>